We are live to tape. I'm your host today, Lou Marinoff. I know most of you, if not all of you, and I'm happy to see you again. Welcome to our APA members, members of the public, and our very special featured guest today, whom I will introduce without further ado. Bill, it's great, great to see you and great to have you on board today. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And uh, we, we should have a very interesting time with you. Let me just introduce Bill. For those of you who may not know him, and I suspect that's very few, um, Bill Irwin. Will you, may I call you Bill? Is that okay? Please call me Bill, Lou. All right. I'll call you Bill, but not in the intro. William Irwin is Hervé A. LeBlanc, Distinguished Service Professor and Professor of Philosophy at King's College in Pennsylvania. He originated the philosophy and popular culture genre of books with Seinfeld and Philosophy, which was published by the Open Court in 2000. Many other volumes followed. We're going to get we're going to ask you how many and which your favorite ones are, okay? Many other volumes followed and I assume many more will. Currently, Bill is the general editor of the Blackwell Philosophy and Pop Culture series. He's the author of Free Market The Free Market Existentialist: Capitalism Without Consumerism, Wiley Blackwell 2015. And God is a Question, Not an Answer, Roman and Littlefield 2018. He has also published two novels and two collections of poetry. Irwin has been interviewed by CNN, NPR, MSNBC, and the BBC. He blogs for Psychology Today, and his essays have been published by the New York Times. Very exciting, very exciting, Bill, to welcome you. And again, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Lou. It's an honor to be speaking to uh, your group and uh, to the author of Plato, Not Prozac, a book that I read when it first came out and made a big impact on me and uh, uh, formed a common bond, I think, in many well, ways. Well, yeah, I'm sure it did. I've only contributed, I have to confess, I think to only one of your books in this amazing series, but we'll talk more about this forthwith. I have a few questions that I've been really going to ask you, so to speak, and uh, we'll go through those and then we'll open the mic. Um, and I'm sure that that our friends and colleagues will also want to have a chance to interact with you. So here we go. Before we get into any of this work that you've built such a, a great edifice upon, let me ask you, I ask this to all our guests, and I love asking the question because we never get the same answer twice. So what drew you into philosophy to start with? What was your initial impetus? Yeah, so it was back in high school. I had the, uh, I guess, almost stereotypical existential crisis in, in high school. Uh, I uh, was born and raised Catholic and, and had a crisis of faith, lost my faith at that time. And uh, my whole world sort of fell apart, you know? I mean, uh, my life was uh, was shattered in, in a way. And uh, I was looking for some kind of an answer and, uh, the direction I was heading in, uh, was, was philosophy, uh, some, uh, my guidance counselor and English teacher and history teacher at that point, uh, sort of were pointing me in that direction. And I had some vague sense of what philosophy was. And, uh, there wasn't, uh, any kind of easy way to, uh, to have access to it as, a, as a teenager, this would have been in the in the 1980s. I mean, there was a Walden Books at the uh, at the mall, and you know, in the philosophy section uh, before Plato, not Prozac, uh, you could find only uh, a copy of Plato's Republic and the Portable Nietzsche, both of which I bought and and tried to read and thought I understood and uh, that kind of thing. And uh, you know, the the Tao of Pooh would be there and. Uh, probably a copy of the Bible and a misplaced uh, book on astrology. And, you know, that was the philosophy uh, section. Uh, but uh, I was looking for answers and uh, having a hard time finding them. And uh, get, you know, I got to college. Well, I, I wasn't 100 percent sure that I'd be a philosophy major. Uh, I was also interested in, in psychology, uh, trying to deal with my own uh issues and uh and literature and history and all those sorts of things but 
uh, found my way in, into philosophy in one way or another. And uh, here I am many years later, I guess. Some years later. So, but, but without minus the shortcut, what was your PhD based on? What could you tell us a little bit about your initial research? And Sure. Uh, so uh, I, I went to the State University of New York at Buffalo and uh, I, I wisely chose my uh, dissertation director uh, based on the person uh, more so than what he was working on or expert in. Uh, really, one of the greatest human beings I've known, Jorge Gracia, uh, who has since passed away. And uh, he was a medievalist by training, and I had really no interest in medieval philosophy. But at the time that I was there in the 90s, he was doing work on uh, textuality. Uh, a theory of textuality was the book that came out at that time. Uh, and basically theory of interpretation, the nature of texts, that sort of thing. Uh, and so I chose to write my dissertation uh, in that area, uh, sort of straddling analytic and continental philosophy and uh, that was later revised and uh, and published as my first book, actually, Intentionalist Interpretation. Great. And that, that's, of course, a far cry from public philosophy. And you, you were doing public philosophy before it was called public philosophy. Uh, so, so how did you segue in, into that branch? Yeah, so uh, in, in a way, it, it, it was... There in my origin story of uh, of of looking for books uh, on uh, the meager bookshelves of Walden Books and trying to find something uh, that that I could comprehend, something uh, accessible, relevant, that kind of thing. Uh, and uh, it had always been my uh, attempt in the in the classroom as as a teacher to meet students where they were and try to speak in terms of references and analogies that would click with them. And uh, I was also always a big uh, fan of movies, television, uh, popular music. And so that was a lot of the uh, reference material that I was drawing on in uh, the classroom and always had a desire to, to write for a, a general audience. And uh, so uh, one of the shows that I was uh, a big fan of at the time was Seinfeld, uh, you know, no surprise in the uh, uh, early to mid '90s, there was, you know, along with The Simpsons, uh, really no, no bigger show and no richer uh, show. And uh, I could count on uh, nearly all of my college uh, students at least being familiar enough to make references and that kind of thing. And uh, I certainly wasn't the only one doing that. In fact, I had uh, a group of friends uh, who were also uh, teaching philosophy. Uh, you know, foremost probably among them, uh, Mark Connard and uh, Ian Scoble, who would later become my co-editors on the, the Simpsons and philosophy. And, and uh, they were among the first two I contacted when I had the idea for Seinfeld and philosophy, basically because, you know, we, we would get together uh, at APPA meet, and not APPA, I, I slipped, there was no APPA. That's okay, meet. that's fine. You could plug yeah. us all you want. But. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the APA meetings, uh, you know, and, and watch Seinfeld and talk about uh, how we'd make use of it in the classroom and that kind of thing. And so this, for me, was always a, a team project uh, from the, from the get-go. I've uh, maybe been the ringleader and taken more credit uh, than I deserve uh, and put my name on books and that kind of thing. Uh, but it's always been a, a, a team project of uh, trying to uh, bring philosophy uh, to people like the 16 year old me looking for it uh, in a way that they might be able to digest. And uh, yeah, so that's the, the the short version of that story, I suppose. Well, that's a great story. And of course, you're being very humble because you are you are the editor and being an editor is a lot of work behind the scenes, as any editor knows. So surely you put in the time as well as the interest in making this happen. Well, I appreciate that one. Yeah. So The Simpsons, was that the, uh, excuse me, Seinfeld was the first, that was the first one. And did you pitch this to a number of publishers? Or oh, Sure. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, it got rejected everywhere, uh, as, as the story usually goes. Uh, it wasn't right for most academic publishers. And we, without a, an agent, I couldn't really get in touch with 
uh, commercial publishers. Uh, and so I was just very fortunate. Uh, Open Court uh, had a history of, uh, of doing oddball kind of books that might be uh, of more interest to, uh, to general readers. So I was fortunate uh, that, that they took an interest and it took off from there. Isn't that astonishing? And it never fails to amaze me. It happened with Plato, not Prozac, too. All the about 35 New York publishers rejected <laughs> it first. So when, when everybody rejects a book, I've learned it's usually a sign of one of two things. Either it's a really bad book or it's a really good book, but you can't tell which until it goes into print. That's right. I've had some really bad books that have been rejected by every publisher, too. They're still on my computer, but... Uh... I'm surprised at your stage... Uh, given your huge success, but we get pigeonholed too, don't we? So the open court was was amenable to this, and Seinfeld was huge. I mean, it was it was it was one of the most successful sitcoms of all time. So it just astonishes me that commercial publishers could not get the relevance of this. That philosophizing about it for an you know for for a regular audience could would would not work. I mean, this is just astounding. Uh, but Open Court was great. And and did you have an immediate success with that book that led to the next one? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think the initial print run was, was 2,000 copies. And I thought, wow, 2,000 copies. That's crazy if they sell that many. Uh, and it sold out, you know, pretty quickly and uh, eventually sold over 100,000 copies. Well, there you go. And that's in English. Has it been translated? Has there been? Oh, yeah, yeah. Actually, it has. That's true. Uh, I'm not sure how good the accounting is on that. I probably haven't gotten all the royalties. Maybe I should, but there depends you which countries we're talking about. Yeah. Let's 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 not get into foreign affairs, but all right. you know, some of them are very scrupulous and some are less careful about their reporting, as you obviously know. Right. But it's, there's a lot of cachet, is there not, to having foreign language editions of a given book? You have a very good translation into Turkish. Oh, in Turkish. Yeah. Yes, we have a very good translation in Turkish. Wonderful. Both both of your books, yeah. Matrix and philosophy, and also same fact. Okay. Well, well thank you, Ibrahim, for keeping okay. tabs on Turkey for us. <laughs> That's a very important <laughs> market as well as an important culture. So there you go, Bill. Did you know it's in Turkish? I don't know if Seinfeld was in Turk was on Turkish TV, but uh you're certainly there in the bookstores. That's great. That's great. Um, so what was the second one? So the, the the second one was the Simpsons and philosophy, and uh, with, with that one, uh, the the two fellows who I mentioned, uh, Ian Scoble and Mark Conard, uh, joined me as editors uh, of of the volume, and uh, that that uh, I mean was actually a bigger uh, and even bigger success. We were fortunate uh, on that one. That that's the the best selling one uh, of all time, actually. Really? And that was early on in the game. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, sales have, have uh, diminished quite a lot uh, over the years. There, in, there was a, a certain novelty uh, to it in uh, in the beginning, uh, and uh, that, that's diminished, I suppose. Maybe. That's one possible explanation. I'm afraid that, that literacy is diminishing, too. I don't know if you've noticed <laughs> Uh, people are not reading as much as they used to or perhaps ought to. That's another factor, surely. Sure. You've also mentioned television. And back, and like you, back in the day, I would draw uh, upon various popular TV shows to make philosophical points in the classroom. I've also found that to be less and less useful as time goes on, uh, because well, that, that's right. And that's one of the uh, the issues that that leads to diminishing uh sales or interest in a particular book the uh i mean it, it's wonderful that we don't just have three network uh or four network uh options for our viewing anymore there's so many uh but but in, in the 90s back in those days when those books uh were first germinating i guess uh seinfeld came out in the year 2000 and then the, the simpsons book might have been 2002 by then but, uh, you know, that that's only, uh, what, 20 years ago. But uh, there there was just a mass concentrated audience for those uh, for those shows such that, you know, even if you weren't a big fan, you just, you know, you knew about them and you had passively seen episodes and things like that. And that's just not the case uh, anymore. Things are more niche and 
uh, that's probably a good thing in many ways that I think, you know, it, it's good for quality uh, for the, uh, uh, for the TV writers uh, to be able to produce something uh, that they're not pandering to as broad an audience as possible. It's something uh, that they, uh, they really have a, a particular vision for, but uh, it, it is less, uh, it, it's less of a tool than for us to use it for mass communication of philosophical ideas afterwards indeed and I, I mean tv writers themselves look like they're in they're in terror now of being replaced by yeah. uh, by you know ai so uh, we'll have to see what where that goes uh, so how many do you are you keeping track you move eventually from open court to blackwell how did how did that what was that transition like uh, <laughs> I, I've never been divorced. Uh, thankfully, I've been married to the same wonderful woman for over 20 years. Uh, but this was a, a, a divorce. Uh, and so, I, you know, there aren't too many happy divorces, I guess. Uh, I, I just wasn't uh, happy with a lot of things they were doing without getting into too much inside baseball or uh, any any of that kind of thing. I, 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 I didn't want to work with them anymore. And so I was I was very glad to, to start up with uh with Blackwell, uh, and I had done uh, about twenty-five volumes with Open Court, uh, and have with with Blackwell, uh, we've got uh, over sixty that we've done, and uh, I think it's up to seventy that are uh, when you count everything in the works. And I should say, to uh, out of fairness to Open Court, that they they continue to do volumes. Uh, Somehow, without me, the world spins. Uh, even without me, uh, and and good on them for it. And so, uh, I mean, there's just been uh, a proliferation, just beyond my imagination. Uh, what when, when when the Simpsons book came out, uh, a student of mine said, "You know, there should be a hundred of these kind of books." And I said, "No, that that that's stupid." <laughs> and maybe it is, but it's turned out that the that there pretty much are, you know, when you count everybody uh, who's had a hand in doing various ones, uh, that there's over a hundred of them. That's just remarkable and remarkable output. And now you could have, if there were any bookstores left, you could have a whole section of the bookstore just devoted to to your publication, <laughs> basically, couldn't you? I could, yeah. I don't know that it, that would be uh, good for their uh, their bottom line, but you could. I suppose. Well, you could, and I mean, maybe you you have or have not encountered this, but but most of us who publish on the trade side have that the the tail wags the dog in this industry more and more. And back in the day when bookstores were still more of a going concern, and Amazon was less, we always had this problem with hybrid books that the if whether uh, an, an agent could interest a publisher would depend on where the book could be shelved. It was always the people shelving the book who would determine whether the book was a good bet to publish or not, because if they couldn't find an obvious place to shelve it. Then they'd say, well, we'll just shelve the project and not publish the book. Did you encounter that at all? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, that was certainly some of it. Uh, and, and actually that, that, uh, that mentality uh, that benefited me in a way as well, in, in the sense of my being able to take credit uh, for so much that maybe I shouldn't have, uh, in the sense that they put my name uh, as series editor on the spine of all these. So in, in order to be able to shelve them uh, together, you know, with the idea that if you had the actual volume editor's uh, name, then they'd be scattered on the shelf. So, uh, you know, it, it's both benefited me and hurt me. Yes, and uh, there are, there are several authors in in that sort of situation as well. It may astonish you to know that Plato on Prozac has more often been shelved in the psychology or the self help section rather than philosophy. So there you go. Not not all these books that bring philosophy to the public eye are necessarily considered philosophy by the people who shelve the shelve them in the bookstores. So we're back to that. It doesn't go away. Right. It's an irony, right? right? Right. And well, I mean, and, and as, as you say, though, Amazon has become the, uh, the dominant player. So that that's becoming less and less of the issue. 
Yeah, for be- again, for better and for worse. You right. can get anything on your door tomorrow, but we don't have... Uh, I guess then you're safe to say you're a bibliophile, and yeah. you probably like to spend time in bookstores just looking around and picking through books and whatnot. Yeah, is that is that a reasonable assumption? It is, it, yeah, that, that's true, but uh, I don't do it as much as uh, as I used to. And, and what I always like best, uh, and I suppose this is... Uh, True of lots of the, the folks who are uh, who are joining us is uh, is a used bookstore, uh, and the serendipity that comes with that, and the smell of old books and all that kind of thing, and, and those are really gone now, unfortunately. You know, completely, uh, completely. I have on my shelf two pocket book, two paperback books that are were published as guides to the bookstores of London. Oh. Uh, there were so many, and New York and London, I think, were the epitomes of that kind of thing, where you could get, if you you could get first editions, really valuable, occasionally you'd find valuable first editions of books in a secondhand bookstore, and you'd get them for a couple of dollars, and the vendors didn't even know what they were selling. Right. So there was always that treasure hunt going on. But the idea of small niche bookstores where the, the the person had read all they had maybe four thousand books but they'd read them all and they'd want to have a conversation with you about the books whether whether you bought a book or not at the end of the day that's all been wiped out by pretty much by amazon yeah yeah unfortunately yeah but of course the upside is you can pretty much get a book next day so what would you recommend to our participants to our audience today if uh, let's suppose, for the sake of argument, that n- no one else in your audience has read one of these, and they've got a lot to choose from. So, what are your top three picks? What would you recommend to people who want to dip into your library of of popular philosophy works? Well, uh, so the uh, the nice thing about having so many of them, right, is that uh, we're catering to fandoms uh, of of virtually well. Uh, way across the, the the spectrum so if somebody asks me that i usually say well take take a look at the list and see what you're a fan of and and jump in there but uh it, treating your uh your your uh question uh in the spirit that it was uh it was asked uh, i i would probably say the matrix and philosophy would be the best of them uh in that regard uh part partly because uh, you know, the, the Matrix was such a philosophical sensation when, when it first came out. And, uh, it, you know, we had a follow up book uh, dealing with the sequels. And that's the one that you had uh, contributed a fine essay to, Lou. And part of what we dealt with in uh, that book was why the sequels were not quite as good. And you had a great argument about uh, Mimesis and, uh, and Plato and, uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, but the first Matrix movie, and we have the Matrix and philosophy that that deals with that. I mean, you can watch one two-hour movie, and it raises so many great philosophical questions. And uh, was a movie that felt like it was uh, almost a gift uh, to us uh, to do that kind of analysis with. So it would probably be that one. I, I would I would give that one a vote too, and I still get mileage out of that movie in the classroom when teaching Descartes and the students who read his meditations for the first time and who've seen the matrix now give us a little more respect because we cooked this up at least 400, you know, three, four, yeah, it's been a while. Right. So, uh, what was it? 1634, the meditations were published. So, you know, that gives us some history. And yeah. of course, you can go back to Plato's cave to get the original version. So our students will, will find some cachet, in philosophy through that and so it was really good that you did the book and thank you for remembering my my contribution to the sequel i i i suspect that your own sequel of the 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 essays on the sequel to the matrix probably didn't do as well as the essays on the matrix no that's absolutely pattern is that right yeah that's right predictably so and i think you you uh as much as forecast that would happen in your own essay in the book uh on it but uh yeah, yeah I really enjoyed that that ch- challenge of writing for you. And um, the the only thing that, that really perturbed me was having to watch the other two episodes of The Matrix in order to you know write a credible essay, because I love the first one as well, not alone there, 
we yeah. all did. But then the second one, you could start to see them looking for, for something to do and say. And the third one was just ridiculous. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. the movies, so many movies seem to have done better uh, in sequel. You know, the more the more simple and predictable things like Rocky and, uh, you know, maybe Jaws. Uh, so now let's shift gears a bit, okay? I mean, I'm still trying to process how you could have edited 100 volumes, even even with team you know work and and all of this. I I think it's extraordinary. Do you have another one on the horizon in in production? Uh, well, yeah, one that I'm particularly excited about uh, at the moment. And I I should clarify for folks who are not familiar. I mean, I, I'm the series editor, and so yeah, I mean, I do line edit every chapter in every book but I, I i also have the the volume editors uh who are uh, the main editors for a book but the to, to get to your question uh one that i'm uh, excited about at the moment not because i'm uh i'm a fan uh but because of the potential for who it can reach uh, is our book on taylor swift and philosophy I mean, there's nobody bigger in the world in the moment, uh, I think, than uh, than Taylor Swift. And so we have uh, the volume editors are on that are two wonderful uh, professors from Tilburg University uh, in the Netherlands, Catherine Robb and Georgina Mills, uh, and uh, really excited about uh, the way that that book can reach uh, some, uh, some people, particularly some young women uh, who might not be picking up uh, whatever the book on uh, Star Wars or Star Trek or something like that. Wow, that's that's really interesting. I, I, I mean, I, I want to read reviews of it. I'm not a huge fan of of if if it, if it's country music that she's doing or whatever. I mean, it's not my first choice to listen to, but she is a global megastar now. She and the Super Bowl somehow aligned their stars, and uh, yeah. so she's in in the stratosphere now of, of of world popularity. I expect that book will do very well in many languages. So congratulations. What in a nutshell does she have to do with philosophy? Can I put you on the spot to give us a, a capsule? Yeah, because I, I was sort of skeptical to to start with myself and. Uh, I, I I was not a fan uh, of her music, and I'm still not. But I listened to a fair bit of it, and uh, so I was able to do a good, you know a fair job of this. But she really does have some uh, interesting insights uh, into the way in which uh, the world changes. Uh, sort of phenomenological insights in the way the world changes when you're in love, uh, when you're broken up with. Uh, she has uh, some some great, very poetic lines about. Uh, how you taught me to see a color that I had never seen before, and now I can't see it again. And that th things like this, uh, she she has really uh, really some fascinating uh, insights into. So uh, that among others, she also there are also just really interesting philosophical things uh, about her. She has re-recorded uh, some of her old albums. Uh, because uh, you know they were sold uh, from out from under. So I mean, you you and I as authors talking about rights, right? Wouldn't you love to get the rights back uh, for, for Plato, not Prozac, and you know uh, whatever else? Uh, so she's done interesting things like that 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 sort of raise philosophical issues uh, about whether it's the same song or not, and just. Uh, uh, you know, issues of uh, of agency and feminism and all kinds of things like that. Sure. So well, th th there, there, there really is uh, a lot there uh, for someone to read and appreciate who is not a Taylor Swift fan, who has a Taylor Swift fan in their life. Excellent answer. Thank you. I mean, she is an artist at the end of the day. She's an artist and recording artist. And we can always philosophize about art in any form. So, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm on your side about that. Yeah. irrespective of genre but uh, let me let me just recall um, have you ever done uh, a book on football and philosophy now do you mean american football I, i'm not talking about soccer we're, okay. we're, we're you know we're, we're americans here we're talking yeah. football you know four yeah. down nfl football have you done that yet no. Uh, well, what are you waiting for? I want to be the first to volunteer. All right. to all right. I played college ball. I played high school ball. And, uh, you know, you mentioned Taylor Swift and, of course, you know, Travis Kelsey. There's, a you know, that yes, country's, yes. Up, that country's up our amazing sport. It's not our national sport, but it's a world-class sport 
Of course, I think the Super Bowl gets typically two billion people watching. It's amazing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, you, you're right for sure. All right. Well, if it comes up on your on your agenda, you know, philosophy and football, then count me in. Okay. Well, I would Marinoff's love... my man. He's going to carry the ball for us across the well, goal. Well, for, for a spell, but I play defense. I'll most likely call someone else to fumble it. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> <All right. laughs> however you want to spin the metaphor, I think it might be a good idea. I'm just throwing it out there, Bill. You you know, you could do philosophy in anything, it looks no, like. No, you're right. And and actually, we did a baseball and philosophy book uh, back early on when I was with Open Court, and, uh, and that went well. And uh, Open Court, after I left, uh, did a, a soccer uh, and philosophy. That's why I was wondering when you were asking about football and football and uh, that sort of thing. Right. Well, and, if we were and, doing if we were doing this in the UK, I would have said football meaning soccer. You sure. know, I guess you're bilingual as I am. You know, American English and UK English being what they are. But let's get back to the you know the pigskin. All right, <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> That's what it's still made of. Okay, let's change the tack before we open the mic. Um, and and I'm sure we're going to have some interaction from from our audience. Okay, but before we we get there, I do have a couple of more questions. I have a really burning question. Could you please explain to us capitalism without consumerism? What is this? What is this existential capitalism that you're talking about? <laughs> well, all right. So uh, one of the first philosophers who I sort of latched on to uh, in browsing the bookstores and that kind of thing was Jean-Paul Sartre. Uh, and uh, Sartre uh, was not a capitalist. Uh, he was uh, a Marxist. Uh, and the uh, there always seemed to me to be a tension uh, in his argument for individual freedom and responsibility uh, on the one hand, and then uh, his championing of uh, of socialism on, on the on the other. And so part of the book uh, just argues that point and and how. Uh, when you look at Sartre, there really are, I think, two different Sartres, the way there are maybe two different Wittgensteins or or whatever else, that there, there isn't uh, a clean connection between the early and, and late Sartre. Uh, and uh, I, I do very much uh, embrace uh, his early existentialism, uh, but I, I, I myself don't embrace his uh, his later Marxist work or uh, his uh, his socialism, and I think actually there's a lot uh, to be uh, to be applied from existentialist insights uh, to uh, a, a free market approach in terms of taking responsibility uh, and also dealing with some of the uh, the problems uh, that tend to plague uh, capitalist uh, and free market uh, societies, alienation uh, and uh, a sense of, uh, well, uh, existentialist despair or ennui or whatever the case uh, may be. The, uh, the idea that one can self-define uh, rather than uh, let one's uh, uh, kind of consumer choices define one is, is the basic uh, idea there. If, you know, consumerism is this uh, tendency uh, to be what we consume, to uh, define ourselves by the brands that we wear and and this sort of thing. Uh, well, I, I, I find existentialism, uh, in particularly early uh, Sartre and existentialism, is giving some of the tools for self definition. Uh, and you can be uh, of uh, a capitalist society, uh, or I should say, in it without being of it in 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 certain senses. And so. Uh, you can embrace all the the choices. So we're talking about the you know bookstores and all that kind of thing that uh, a society uh, you know makes available without necessarily uh, being consumed uh, by them. I guess that's sort of uh, the nickel version uh, of it, uh, Lou. So well, no, that's fantastic. And I, I also I'm not an existentialist by any by any means but uh, more of a platonist which i guess is the opposite end of that spectrum but nonetheless i i do share that particular view that our choices will also not necessarily define us but reflect something deep within us and and i guess that you must despair then 
at what's become of our uh, consumer society because it's 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 not even a question now of you know defining yourself by what you buy but it's rather that don't you think people have uh, are having identities imposed on them by web 2.0 and that it's like we are what websites we tune into now yeah no that that's very right uh and that, that that's the sort of default that you could easily uh let form you right so uh let the buyer beware let the consumer beware right uh and uh, be sure not to simply uh, read what you agree with, right? I mean, uh, yeah, but the research is just this: people are going to go back to revisit the same sites that that echo, you know, whatever maybe their genuine sentiments are, or what's been imposed on them without that subliminally or otherwise, yeah. unconsciously, people will will gravitate toward things for whatever reasons. What scares me. And I really, you know, I mean, in a sense, it's 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 horrifying that that we're not just now talking about e-commerce, which is fine. I mean, it's a multi-trillion dollar enterprise. It's not getting smaller, connects the globe, et cetera. But it seems like the, the competition now is not about money. It's about consciousness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's the attention economy, they call it, right? And uh, it's about control and power. And, and you know, money is a big part of the package as well. Money's a part of it, but money follows consciousness. If if people can, can hijack consciousness long enough, then someone's going to dig into their pockets and keep right. and sustain it or donate to it. But that scares me. I don't know if you've lost any sleep over this, but if you're Sartre, and probably you have. Yeah, yeah. I mean... It, it starts with awareness, though, right? And uh, so, I mean, uh, I, I'm a, an oddball. I, I, I don't even uh, have a smartphone myself. Uh, you know, I, I've got a, a cell phone, but it's in the glove compartment of my car, and it might be charged, and I don't know the number to it. And it's mostly there in case I get a flat tire and I have to call AAA, but it's it's likely not even to be charged then. So, you know. Uh, I've, I've made choices like that to keep myself more free. Hats off to you. I only know one other person who literally refuses to own a smartphone, and he's having more and more trouble getting basic things done. I mean, from <laughs> filling prescriptions to secondary, you know, uh, uh, security checks on logins where they text you. Uh, you know, a code and you know, all this stuff. Now you, they're you demanding. Know, ha somebody has to. My wife has the uh, the smartphone. I can rely on her when when a code has to be sent. Oh, so you do have a plan B, which is I've your got a plan significant B. other. Okay, because yeah. imagine if she if her phone were not in the picture, what would you do? You probably have to get one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's right. And and I, it's not some kind of harsh moral stance that that I take against them or anything like that. I I just was never attracted to it. And, uh, you know, I found myself drifting more and more that way, but it's probably emblematic of lots of the choices that I've made. So in the, uh, existentialist, uh, the free market existentialist too, I, I advocate, uh, my own brand of minimalism. I mean, uh, try to keep things, you know, really, uh, really simple, not, not out of, uh, any sort of, uh, piety or or morality, but uh, I, I I take pleasure in having you know tattered things and uh, you know not having name brand stuff and that kind of thing. Maybe it's my own sort of uh, perverse ego uh, expressing itself in one way or another. My pride and my lack of pride or whatever. I don't know. Well, it makes you very original, increasingly more and more original as time as time goes on. And kids have these things like surgically attached to them at birth now, virtually. And if Bill Gates has his way, everyone's going to have a chip implanted in their brain. So we'll, you know, yeah. look, well, look, I mean, look, for okay. the old ways of life. I mean, keep that going. All right. We need we need a control group. And you're right. you're it. <laughs> well, I, I have to say, you know, I've I've not been a perfect parent, but I've done well in this regard with my, my children who are 18 and 20 now. And that, of course, they have uh, smartphones, but we sit down to, to dinner and they're not the smartphones are not there. OK. And, you know, they're not consumed with them the way that other uh, 
that other people their age are. I think that's cool. Is that a house rule or just a, or just a convention? Well, it's just it's just the way it developed. I mean, I didn't have a phone uh, at the dinner table, and my wife didn't. And why would anybody? You know. Well, because the I mean, the governor had to make it a house rule if he's telling the truth. Arnold's kids were sitting at the dinner table texting each other past the salt, and yeah, he just, yeah. then they drew the line. They said no uh, more cell phones at the dinner table. Yeah. Good. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so now we go from Sartre, who not only is an existentialist and a communist, but also an atheist. And now you've written another book, God is a Question. Um, so how does that play out? And what is the question? Or is there a question? <laughs> Tell us about that book. Oh, it, 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 it's a, a kind of a clever line that I stole from uh, from a better book. Uh, there's a, a book called The Merceau Investigation, which is uh, a, a sequel to Camus' The Stranger, not written by Camus, though. Uh, and it's written uh, from the Arab's perspective, right? I mean, the, uh, the Arab who was killed in The, in the Stranger is kind of forgotten. Uh, and so it, it takes... Uh, the perspective of the brother of the Arab who was actually killed, and uh, you know, here this uh, this guy Marceau becomes some sort of a folk hero in this book that they write about him. And how about my brother, right? And uh, there's a lot, you know, uh, he he is uh, a Muslim, uh, and uh, he's having his own sort of crisis of faith. And is being hounded uh, by an imam, uh, you know, with uh, the answer. Uh, and he blurts out at the imam, uh, God is a question, not an answer. Uh, and I just love that uh, so much. Uh, and it, it just sort of fit with my uh, pedagogy in, uh, in teaching my existentialism course. Uh, where we're reading uh, Kierkegaard and, uh, and Nietzsche and Dostoevsky, and uh, I just I, I used it as the as the title of uh, an op-ed that I had written uh, that got published in the New York Times, and uh, you know that got uh, that got a, a a real response, and so uh, really just responding to all the criticisms <laughs> that I got for that. Uh, a short book came out of it. Uh, but basically the idea of it was, this is what caused so many people to bristle, uh, was I called myself an honest atheist, uh, by which I meant I've got doubts uh, that just as uh, a devout uh, believer uh, like Thomas Merton or uh, whoever else you might name, uh, Mother Teresa, for that matter, uh, had doubts. Now, you wouldn't say that she's not a believer, right? Uh, and, uh, it, you know, uh, I don't particularly like labels very much as, a, as an existentialist, but if I had to call myself anything, I guess I'd call myself an honest atheist. If uh, the way I've described myself uh, in someone else's mind makes me an agnostic or some kind of secret Christian. I've been called all kinds of uh, things. Uh, and, and the people who got most angry uh, about the op-ed, I have to say, uh, were atheists. Uh, you know, I, I, it, it, you know uh, it, it certainly could have rubbed uh, any number of Christians and believers of, uh, of any number of faiths the wrong way. But uh, I got the uh, most supportive uh, responses uh, from them talking because really the idea of the op-ed and the book was uh, was finding common ground uh, between uh, believers uh, and and non-believers. Uh, you know, I, I, I uh, if I had to give myself another uh, label or or say who I've uh, liked, I like the good old-fashioned uh atheists like uh like Nietzsche and Sartre uh for them you know the the death of God or the loss of God was a real big deal not Richard Dawkins and the uh the new atheists who just have this strident dismissive tone and uh you know want to say you know so just just expressing uh that an atheist an honest atheist should have uh have doubts uh, just as uh, Mother Teresa or Thomas Merton or any believer uh, will, if honest, say they have doubts, should be some 
some place of common ground in humanity. So that yeah. that's basically what that was about. Well, that, that's great. And thank you for, for the eloquent summary. I also tend to agree, by the way. I mean, I've written as well on this minutely, but the idea being that faith and doubt coexist quite happily. Um, it's only the zealots who have no room for doubt. The, the, the fanatics have no room for doubt because they're probably not secure enough in their faith, uh, possibly. But but I mean, I, I, I really understand what you're saying, I think. And and also wholeheartedly agree. It's not a contradiction in terms to to believe something and and to and to harbor some some space for for let's say questions or skepticism. And that's a very mature view, I guess. Post Dawkins, the new religion is scientism. It's 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 a new religion that what well, we believe science either explains everything now or will tomorrow. Excuse me, you know that's the new Messiah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I believe the science, the science, right? As if uh, there were the settled yeah. science on on, on yeah. ongoing issues, right? Yeah, the one true science. Okay, before we open the mic, what about this whole other side of you, which is a novelist and an and a, and a, and a poetry anthologist? Tell us about your novels, please. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I, this the, I, like I said in my uh, my origin story. I mean, uh, philosophy and and literature to me. I mean, that's that's one of the places that I was finding finding it and looking for it uh, at, at first. And I, I always wanted to uh, to try to write uh, write fiction, and uh, you know that that was uh, much more frustrating than trying to uh, to publish uh, nonfiction, Lou. I mean. Uh, uh, both of the the novels that I've written got published by very small presses. I was never able to get uh, an agent to represent them and take them to the big New York publishers or any of that kind of thing. So uh, anyway, I've, I've published two small novels, one, one called Free Dakota, uh, which uh, imagines uh, a scenario which, you know, may uh, be coming more and more close to uh, unfortunately, a possibility of, of what would happen if one of the uh, United States today seceded, namely, in this case, North Dakota, uh, you know, broke off uh, as uh, strange uh, to imagine as that is. So that's the uh, the, the scenario there. Uh, and the other one uh, is called Little Siddhartha, which is uh, my own sequel to uh, to Hesse's uh, wonderful novel, Siddhartha, that was really impactful on me, uh, you know, reading that in high school and, you know, Buddhism and uh, and, and Eastern philosophy uh, have always been a big part of my uh, interest in philosophy. And uh, so I was probably partly inspired by that other book. I mentioned the Merceau investigation, where this guy wrote a uh, a sequel to uh, The Stranger and thought, hey, why couldn't somebody write a sequel to Siddhartha, partly because uh, there's an opening in in uh, Hesse's Siddhartha, uh, which is his uh, the the title character's son, uh, who uh, folks who remember the uh, the story, he's reunited uh, with uh, his lover Kamala, and to his surprise, he discovers that he has a son, and he tries to take care of the son, but the son runs away, and so. Uh, I imagine uh, what what does the son go through and how does he develop? And I take it through a generation after that. And anyway, it's just uh, uh, maybe more of a writing exercise uh, than a novel uh, that anybody wants to read. But uh, I did it anyway. And, and there you go. Well, fantastic. We can find these books on Amazon. You can find everything on Amazon, Lou, and they'll deliver it right to your door. Yes, yep. yes. Well, okay. I'm just just check, just reality check. I'm not sure. No, that... no. I, well, I love it. I love okay, it. no, that's that's great. And the poetry. You're also a poet. Where do you find time or inspiration to write poetry? During COVID, uh, you know, I, I had some uh, some time that led into a sabbatical. And uh, I, I, I had uh, like, uh, you know, budding existentialists and disaffected youth everywhere dabbled in in poetry and notebooks and things like that in, uh, in my youth and always wanted to do it. Uh, and of course, people hate poetry. <laughs> Most people, uh, you know, they don't read it. They don't understand it. They don't like it. Most people. Uh, it, it's a tough sell. It's a tougher sell. 
uh, than philosophy. Uh, this may not be true of uh, of the folks who are listening and with us today, and it's not true of you and me, Lou, that we hate poetry. Uh, but the average person, uh, you know, finds it confusing and uh, and off putting and uh, some kind of game. And so my, my aim was to write uh, poetry that was philosophical and also accessible. And so the the, the title of uh, of one of the the poetry collections is both and. And the uh, the cover is uh, an image of the famous duck rabbit uh, image, right? Which is both duck and rabbit, depending on how you look at it. Uh, and uh, the idea with the poetry is uh, if you read it and say, well, that's really bad poetry, I could say, yeah, but it's, it's good philosophy, isn't it? Uh, and if you read it and say... Well, that's lousy philosophy. I can well, but it's good poetry, isn't it? Uh, right. And well, uh, maybe it's neither. Maybe neither nor is what the reviewer uh, would want to say. <laughs> but I'm but I'm trying to go for both and there. Fantastic, fantastic. So you'll cover the the you know Aristotle square of opposition one way or the other. You've covered. Yes. It. Sounds like you've covered it. Uh, but I I am always impressed by, by poetry. I, I want to say this to you that because because I think poets are pure spirits. It is a tougher sell than philosophy. But philosophers always entertain this hope of selling a few books somehow. You know, we always think there must be some other people out there who can't fail to appreciate our you know whatever. It is. But poetry, they most pure poets i've met quite a few and i've learned from some they seem to be really unattached they they write because they're inspired to write they the muse touches them the poetry pours out and they don't seem to mind the consequences too much you know the the the, the troubles they have to get published are legendary in the stories associated with them and yet there's something that touches poets that touches nobody else. So I, my hat's off to you if you're smitten with that on top of everything else. That's great. And maybe I'll go there first when I when I check you out on Amazon. Okay. <laughs> oh, Bill, I'd like to open the mic now. We have, I'm sure, some folks who, who would like to get their, their, their dibs in. So um, uh, please bear with us. Okay. If anybody wants to talk hey zach welcome welcome um please Hi. Yourself. go ahead let me spotlight you zach you're you're new to the group and welcome nice to see you here okay you are live Hopefully my mic is working good nice uh nice to meet you bill i just wanted to express my gratitude and appreciation because as a 19 year old uh star wars and philosophy was the first piece of philosophy ever given to me i mean we read the cave in one English class, but as a, you know, more comprehensive thing. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I'm really grateful for that because Star Wars was just that mythic kind of tale mixed with like, wow, you can get so much out of this. And then, of course, Tolkien and philosophy, you know, both of those uh, as a classic, classic nerd um, were very inspirational. Uh, and I'm wondering, I haven't checked the list, if you've done a, like a Dungeons and Dragons or role-playing and philosophy, um, because I like, I'm a, I'm a published author in the, in that world too. Um, so, you know, I was like, oh, that would be really interesting to, to write about role-playing and perspective shifting and things like that, if, if that ever came up. But, uh, yeah, th thank you so much, Zach. The, yeah. That warms the the cockles of my heart more than uh, you may know, right? I mean, this is the very thing that that we're attempting to do with the series, and to to think of the nineteen year old uh, you, uh, you know, uh, coming into philosophy partly because of that is is just so great. And uh, to answer your other question, yes, we've done uh, Dungeons nice. and Dragons uh, and philosophy. Uh, Christopher Robichaud is the uh, volume editor of that. And uh, oddly enough, this is one of those cases where uh, Open Court actually also did uh, Dungeons mm. and Dragons and philosophy. So there are two of them two uh, versions. out there. I'm sure they're <laughs> both good, uh, but I'm sure uh, the one in my series is better. <laughs> and uh, you know, we've actually thought about doing one on critical role as well, but that doesn't mm. seem to be quite as big uh, a phenomenon quite yet. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, if they maybe when their next season comes out or whatever. Uh, but yeah, I don't have any questions, just, you know, appreciation. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. And I'll let let other people talk.
Thank you, Zach. I'd love to hear from you too. If you want to get in touch through email or whatever, and if you're interested in writing for the book sometime. Absolutely. Yeah, that'd be great. Hey, thank you very much, Zach. Appreciation is always welcome. We're a lot of philosophers in the room. We're full of questions, but we love appreciation. And thank you for that. Next up is Yorn and then Karen. Yorn, please uh, unmute and go ahead. Hi, Bill. Um, I'm amazed by your uh, <clears throat> great uh, output in writing and wonder whether you have any time um, to respond to questions from your reading audience. And if you, and if you do, uh, I would like to know uh, what kind of questions typically are being sent to you, um, what, what people are interested in, and what the, what the main issues are. That though, that's uh, I appreciate uh, your kind words, Yorn, and uh, of of course I, I I you know respond to any email that that that's sent. I mean, it it really isn't uh, that I get a huge volume, quite frankly. And uh, you know the, the, the Lou has done a good job of making me sound like I must be busier than I am. Uh, m most of the uh, the email that that I get though uh, is basically uh suggesting other topics that we might uh cover and and sometimes that actually works out and and leads to something and, and i certainly make note of it uh uh so that we're gathering that kind of uh anecdotal data about what people would be interested in uh in reading about and sometimes it's uh you know a kind note of appreciation uh like uh you know uh you know just that, that this was helpful and i was interested in that kind of thing uh you know r rarely do i get someone who wants to uh ask me a direct philosophical question uh, now that i've read uh uh you know lord of the rings and philosophy can you tell me the meaning of life right uh, i mean uh, that that kind of thing uh but uh yeah, uh, so so that that that's that's the kind of uh, response that we tend to get. Yeah, have you, have your responses um, gone so far as to delve into counseling based on your knowledge of philosophy, possible giving possible answers or a vista of solutions to uh, issues your audience has. Yeah, that that is a that's a really good question, Jorn, because sometimes you develop uh, a connection with somebody and a, and a friendship of sorts uh, uh, emerges. It's not you know ordinary or typical, but but there there have been a handful of cases over the years uh, where uh, a connection formed with somebody who started off just by emailing me saying that they liked it, and we went back and forth. And uh, sometimes it does turn out to be. Uh, uh, I see uh, our friend Karen Cuss with her hand up, uh, ready to come in next. She used a great term when I was talking to her the other day about pro bono uh, counseling. So sometimes uh, the email correspondence does turn into a little bit of pro bono uh, uh, philosophical counseling, you might say. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jorn. Great to see you. And I will respond to your email also. Okay. Thanks again. For joining today and please please be well uh as uh, as you say bill karen is up next and i just discovered from you that karen you know karen you guys are what neighbors or something and it's a small world after all so karen please please go ahead jump in yeah there. so so the connection is um he works a mile down the street from where i live and he lives a mile across the river from where I live. So, and I taught originally at King's College. So there's histor historical connection, very much so. Um, but anyway, my question, um, I thought I'd take a spin off of the total eclipse, because I think the total eclipse situation is a total thing for philosophy. So. 
I heard somebody say, I don't know how many how many of us are going to see the total eclipse or not. I wanted to, but I'm not going to. I'm 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 going to be like in the partial eclipse like everybody. But um, I heard somebody say that being in the total eclipse is a spiritual experience. And I thought about that very much philosophically. And I thought, you know what? Actually, it's absolutely not a spiritual experience. It's being in the shadow of a big rock. That's what it is. And it 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 does just the opposite of, of telling you, reminding you that the sun on which we all depend for forever and ever and people have worshipped it for many years, many peoples. It's not a god, and it's not it's not spiritual. It's it's really not spiritual. Um, so, from that little thought nugget, I'd like to take us into Plato's cave again, thinking about light. And here is my question, and I kind of wrestle with it, and it's really a question, a challenge to all philosophical practitioners. I think. Um, I am so intrigued and interested in doing philosophical counseling and philosophical practice and all of that. And as I've said, I use the word philosophical trenches. I work in the trench, bring philosophy to the trenches. That's how I put it. But suppose you're, you're going into that cave and the people there are in the shadows. They're looking at shadows on the wall. And you find, as 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 Plato found, that they don't want to come out. Um, wouldn't it be easy to kind of set up a coffee shop there and um, bring your advanced knowledge of optics and shadows and you have a coffee shop or maybe a popcorn stand or maybe a whole entertainment industry where you're... Maybe you bring them a little bit towards the light so you can, you know, integrate the sunlight with the fire shadows and you can really do this fancy display and they entertain you and everything and they pay you good money and all that. And I do want money, but I wonder, um, I have sort of like sort of serious misgivings and thoughts about, uh, I love it and I, I, I see the need to be careful about the place for philosophical practice and philosophical counseling lest we cheapen philosophy and we really become entertainers so that's a pretty deep big thought big question i think what, what do you say to that bill well it, it, it's a great question karen and uh it, it draws me back to to something i, I had uh, a thought that slipped away uh, in response to yorn's question uh, because early on, uh, I did get uh, a fair share uh, of uh, of emails from from people telling me this is terrible. What you're doing, you're you're cheapening philosophy. Uh, you're dumbing things down. This is you know just the lowest common denominator, uh, and and all of that kind of thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, that, uh, maybe Lou, uh, ran into some of that kind of thing too, with Plato, not Prozac and, you know, uh, it, it, it's true that, uh, we don't want to make, uh, everything simply into pure entertainment. I mean, the same issue comes up in, uh, in teaching in the classroom, uh, that there's more and more of a demand uh to though this is boring uh you've got to keep us interested you got to keep us entertained and on a certain level i'm sympathetic to that because i like to be entertained and interested and in, in everything else as well and <clears throat> so i mean it's a delicate balancing point uh i, I think the good news uh for uh for karen uh and and folks doing philosophical counseling is that uh i don't think that that cheapens philosophy in any way uh at all uh even though uh you may have to uh formulate ideas in in ways that are not you know uh their their strictest possible articulation and 
uh, th this sort of thing, uh, it, it's all clearly done in the service of helping someone, right? I mean, uh, the, the difficulty when you're writing for uh, a popular audience and uh, and having some success at selling some kind of books, uh, some number of books, is that you have to keep asking yourself, uh, what what really are my motivations, right? Am I doing this uh, for applause and dollars or am I really doing this for the reasons uh, that I'm saying uh, to to bring you know philosophy uh, to as many people as possible in in a way that they can appreciate and and uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, so uh, yeah, I mean uh, the the only you know it it it, it, it kind of brings uh, up to me the uh, the idea of the imposter syndrome too and. Uh, the, to my my mind, the only people who've never uh, dealt with the imposter syndrome are imposters, right? And so the very fact uh, that uh, you, Karen, and others are asking the question uh, is a pretty good sign uh, of uh, of the right intent uh, and motivation. A little a little doubt is is good, but I I, I think I know what the imposter syndrome, but. But a little, uh, you know, self examination, as as Socrates would say, I, I, I dare to say, I think that would be good for any any of us, all of us, the whole profession. Um, I I know I need to eat. That's for sure. I like funny. So, so I'm pondering this from a real way, and I very, very much appreciate what you say about entertainment and teaching. I, uh, you know, I I don't have any great um history of, of what I've done on any of that but uh I, I see that very much and I have again kind of like like you do I think mixed feelings about that I I, I like to be entertained too um but uh but anyway it's, it's good talking with you I hope to be in touch again yes thank you Karen. Well, you, you guys are neighbors so it's it's I mean you're, you're you could practically open the window and talk to each other I guess well, Lou if I may there's a funny story there I mean uh We've been neighbors for about 30 years, but we met for the first time uh, on Thursday. Uh, and and really, I, I owe my very happy life to Karen in, in a certain way, because if she had stayed at King's College, there, there wouldn't have been a job opening for me a few years later. Uh, and I wouldn't have uh, moved here and, uh, and met my wife and had my wonderful children and the life that I've had. And and it gets stranger too in the sense that uh, Karen told me about the contingencies that led her to get the job, and uh, it actually pointed back to Alistair McIntyre agreeing to recommend Karen, although he had never had her in a course. And so I feel like I owe my life to Alistair McIntyre in a strange sort of way uh, that I never thought possible. Well, uh, listen, the world works in mysterious ways, whether you want to attribute it to God or some other agency. Uh, <laughs> But there are mysteries in the universe that unfold before our very eyes. And Karen, I was going to weigh in on this too with Bill earlier. So you're, you know, you're on, you're exactly on the pulse. I, I already knew the answer to the question in his case, and he reflected it back. You know, did you ever get any flack from philosophers for popularizing philosophy? This is what we call a no-brainer. Um, we all get flack for it, and they don't understand. And this is now lessening, but the hard-boiled analytic types uh, early on, they were always horrified, and they tarred us with this brush, and they called it they called us popularizers in the most pejorative possible tone. And we tried to explain to them that we didn't take vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience when we applied for jobs in the university. They're confusing us with a, you know, with a monastic order. And in fact, I like the analogy or the simile of whiskey. You know, some people like their whiskey neat, you know, and uh, with its single malt, I like it neat too. Other people will put ice in it. Other people will water it down. Well, it's a sorority's paradox at the end of the day. How much water do you have to put in the glass until there's no more whiskey? You know, even one drop of whiskey is still detectable. And if people can absorb philosophy by, by virtue of being watered down, they're still going to be better off at the end of the day than not having tasted it at all. So that's <clears throat> my defense if, in case, you know, we need one. Is that fair enough? We have to bring it outside the academy because the academy is failing by being the ivory tower. I mean, <clears throat> humanities are being defunded as we speak. 
And it's because they've they've thought for a long time the world owed them a living to be remote and inaccessible. And guess what? The world doesn't. You got to be relevant in some way. And uh, and I see no contradiction. And I'm sure our our most of pe- most folks in the house w- would be very happy on the one hand to do technical work and publish technical papers. Most of us have done that. But on the other hand, to sit down and have a philosophical conversation in a cafe, what's wrong with that? Or to publish a you know a, a popular philosophy book, what's wrong with that? What the academicians don't know, particularly some of the hard boiled types who accuse us of being popularizers is that a lot of people ended up taking philosophy courses because they discovered philosophy in a popular way. And then they said, wait a minute, this is good stuff. I want more. And then they came back to the university. And if I can blow Appa's horn for a moment, one of our prerequisites is an MA in philosophy. And over the years, it's 25 now. I can't tell you how many. It's more than I can count. People have actually gone back and earned a master's degree in philosophy so they can take our three-day certification program. So think about that. We're doing philosophy departments all over the world a huge favor, and the people who admit them don't often realize this. They they want that they see the MA as as instrumentally. They want to then become practitioners, so it becomes a platform for them. I don't see this necessary divorce between theory and practice. I think everyone's better off when we find a way to stitch them together. Okay, so you push my buttons on this too, and I'll I'll stop there. But thank you, Karen. It's great to see you again. Um, okay, and we still have hands up, so um, I would like to go to Ibrahim next. Ibrahim, you please unmute yourself and uh, and go for it. Great to see yeah. you, and, and Tom. Thank you, thank you. But let me first t- uh, tell my observation. I have many students and many colleagues when they after they watch the uh, Matrix movie, then they they read the Bill's book. And they then come out, they still have questions. They ask me what, uh, where uh, from go, from here I can go. So I think it is very, very important to uh, write this kind of the books. The second one, uh, Lou, uh, I have a student, you know, PhD, uh, P- master students know he's doing uh, his uh, master uh, uh, about your work because he's retired from, from military. And he said it at once that uh, I, I have uh, some psychological problems and I had to use uh, Prozac. But, you know, it was uh, a lot of side effects for me and by, for, my, uh, for the sake of my, uh, myself, my head and my family, raise, raise my family, I, I had to use it. But when I saw the book, I just, oh my gosh, let's, let's, uh, let me just read it if maybe I can get rid of this medicine. The, the antidepressants and and it works he said and after reading this book i become i i just i i, I feel better then he retired and he started to 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 uh, uh, a master degree in philosophy and he is a very ambitious student you see they are just come not coming from just you know department of, of philosophies or studying uh, reading from plato or uh, uh, Nietzsche or others, but you know, some. I think this is you are you are making a great job. There is no doubt about that, and I I don't think it is a cheapening of philosophy. It is it, when uh, I, I read the Pierre uh, Hado, and he said, you know, in the, in the ancient Greeks, you know, they were the, the the philosophy was in agora, in the name of this, uh, uh, you know, or or meetings, you know. And uh, the second, uh, n- n- my second question, what do you think about, you know, also there's this philosophy beyond, again, a uh, Netflix series of uh, Good Place. And again, there's a philosophy, there's a lot of arguments, there are disc- ethical problems. And, you know, uh, and maybe in the future we will be more and more, you know, uh, after so uh, th- thinkers, because we are, we are we are trying a lot of daily questions in, 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 uh, uh, people's life. Thank you. Thank you, Abraham. It's, it's wonderful to hear that uh, someone would read The Matrix and Philosophy and then come to you as the professor and ask where to go next, right? I mean, that that's really the uh, the hope for, the, for this kind of thing. And you mentioned The Good Place as well. And uh, so I'll put in a plug for that. We, we do have uh, The Good Place and, uh, and Philosophy. That was another uh, 
piece of pop culture that seemed tailor made for this kind of thing, purposely so in some ways. And, uh, maybe some of the other. Kind. I, I, I think sometimes we uh, we are uh, you know missing the the, the phenomenon of uh, globalization. Everything is connected to everything. People is just you know they are start from a movie, from a TV series, from a uh, Twitter message or social media message. Then they go further. They ask further questions. They can easily reach other, you know, networks. And then they can reborn. Yeah, I have a lot of experience, you know, they're just very brilliant minds, you know. They're, they're in their 40s, in their 50s, you know. They just, you know, I just want to go further. Then we say, yes, let's go. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you very much, Ibrahim. Great to see you. Great yeah. to see you. Thank right. you. Uh, Tom, you've been very patient, so please unmute and uh, and go ahead. Hi, Bill. Love hey, your Bob. series. Uh, I'm a, a lawyer by trade, uh, and uh, but I enjoy these kinds of books because it it gets us back to the the classics and gets us back to thinking about philosophy and and one of the I have several questions. I won't bore you with all of them, but. Um, can you tell me like about how your process of picking these topics goes? Is it driven by the authors? Is it driven by your, your mind? Is it driven by a committee? And then another question I have is you ever gotten blowback from, from a, from a, like a group or the program or the musician and what has been said in your books about their like their show or their music have you ever gotten blowback or litigation from that and uh just the process of how you pick that uh and frankly you strike me as a musician i was wondering if you're a musician i know lou is a classical guitarist and i'm a bass player by hobby i just wondered if you so lots of questions feel free to just chime in and answer any of those if you like thank you Thank you, Tom. I appreciate it all. And to, to, I, I'll try to answer them all. Remind me if I if I miss. Uh, but uh, let, let, let's see. So the process of deciding. Uh, so uh, it, it, it is really by committee. Uh, ultimately, the publisher uh, holds the purse strings. And, and so they decide. I don't have any kind of uh, authority over that, uh, although I, I, I think they listen to me. Uh, I'm open to uh, queries and suggestions uh, all the time, and so I, I hear from people on a on a pretty regular basis. Folks who have it in mind that they would like to edit whatever uh, the next volume might be, Taylor Swift and philosophy, for example. Or as was uh, said uh, when I think it was uh, an answer to Yorn's question, sometimes uh, it's a person who's read one of the books and has and has an idea for well what I would like to read is is this one uh, and and we're always just have our eye on uh, on what the next uh, possible thing might be so for example at the very moment uh, Netflix has dropped the three body problem uh, I don't know that that adaptation is going to be a, enough of a success to do the three body problem in philosophy but the books uh, uh, in the Three Body Problem series certainly were richly philosophical. So, you know, kind of uh, a mix of all of that, right? Uh, always have the radar up for what could be the next thing and people making suggestions and uh, ultimately the publisher uh, deciding on, uh, on, on what will sell enough. Uh, you know, I've alluded to the fact that sales have diminished considerably over the years. So there was a time like back in you know, back in the dot com era where there there was like every anything dot com uh is, is gonna be a company, right? There was a time at which uh almost anything in philosophy that was popular enough would sell enough. Uh, and that now we've got to get uh you know maybe a little bit more uh selective in terms of the commercial angle that way. Uh let's see what what else uh, you the, had legal, asked the legal question. Yeah, Bill, the legal this was question. reiterated, if I may. Also, we have an echo of that from Michael, who, who asked, have you ever had pushback? This is parallel to Tom. Have you ever had pushback from TV shows, movies, or public figures on using their name 
on a public philosophy book, either copyright issues or discomfort. Sounds like we have another lawyer in the house. Have you ever heard of anything positive or negative from the script writers that you got wrong or that you helped them see something about their own art? Interesting. Okay. Parallel. It's all. Yeah. So I, I can fold all of that in, I think. Uh, so the, the, the answer is no, never anything negative that the only negative actually came, uh, with the second book, the Simpsons and philosophy, uh, which uses, uh, an actual image, uh, from the Simpsons on the cover. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, it was bought, uh, by open court to use, uh, from someone who didn't have the rights, uh, to, to sell it. Uh, and so uh, Fox, uh, who is you know notoriously litigious, uh, got in touch and said, you know, what do you think you're doing? Uh, and they said, well, we got the rights. And uh, in, in any event, uh, it was so clear that we were, were, you know, being honest about we thought we legitimately had the rights uh, that as long as we helped them go after the, you know, the wrongdoer who had sold the rights that they didn't have. They actually gave us a better image to to use, so it, it actually worked out well. Uh, and this and the the cover for Seinfeld in philosophy, which is a great uh, image of uh, the Seinfeld cast, was bought from the same uh, people who didn't actually have the rights to sell it to us. But the Se but Seinfeld never complained about it, and so to this day, that's the cover. Uh, there have been covers, uh, in, in the past, uh, that the, I, I guess the, the, the law has changed, uh, and evolved over the years, particularly international law, what could be used as an image and not. Uh, so the cover is always, uh, the real, uh, the real issue. Uh, we, we, we did, uh, you know, it's, it's all considered within fair use to use, quotations from dialogues and movies and television shows, et cetera. Uh, so, you know, I, I did hear from one of the Seinfeld script writers, uh, the one who had written uh, or was co-writer for the famous uh, episode on George doing the opposite. Uh, and, and he loved uh, the essay on that uh, and uh, had mentioned the good place before one, one of the few uh times when we've actually gotten cooperation uh michael shore uh who was the creator and chief writer for the good place wrote a, a foreword uh for our good place and philosophy so that was a that was a nice uh thing and we had done at, shortly after the good place in philosophy the expanse and philosophy the sci-fi show and series of uh, of novels, and likewise gotten cooperation there, uh, but very little reaction uh, in, in general from uh, from the creatives behind things, uh, and and nothing negative except, like I said, that one encounter with Fox, and they turned out to be nice and didn't crush us like bugs, uh, which they could have done, but actually helped out with a better cover. And uh, am I a musician? Uh, no, not really. I'm, I'm teaching myself uh, acoustic guitar uh, at the moment using some YouTube tutorials. And but I'm a, I'm a huge music fan. And, it, and it's one of the gaps in my uh, education that I never learned to play a musical instrument. And so I'm trying to rectify that before. Well, some of the music books, you, some of the music books you've written are, are really very fun, like Jimi Hendrix and Led Zeppelin and some of those books have been really fun for me as a closet musician. Um, so I thank you for that. And if I can ask one more question, uh, have you been able to try to get these books into high schools? T the thought of Taylor Swift, uh, I think I think if we can get these books in the high schools, it would be really well received by the kids. There has been some, uh, some success that way. Uh, it's hard to market directly to them so it, it it's largely been uh on on the basis of uh particularly in private high schools where they have uh more authority over the uh over the curriculum uh and so there'd be like a senior elective on popular culture and philosophy that kind of thing uh and and we have done uh a book called Introducing Philosophy Through Pop Culture, 
uh, which is intended as a supplementary text, either for an introduction to philosophy course, or it's been used as a kind of a standalone thing occasionally in uh, in high schools where it, it collects uh, essays from various books in the series, you know, a metaphysics essay from this, uh, you know, an ethics uh, essay from the Good Place book, et cetera. And, and so that there's been some uptake in some high schools with that. Uh, but yeah, that, that's a great question. And I'd love to see more of it. So thank you, Tom. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you very much, Tom. It's great to see you. Uh, Bill, this is, that was very interesting, and uh, we we probably share some concerns about licensing of images and and titles and things like this. And I'm very relieved, in a way, to hear that you've gotten m much uh, positive feedback from the you know from the tr people whose uh, art, in one way or another, you you've treated. We had the same thing uh, with Plato, not Prozac. Prozac's a trademark name. Uh, but uh, Harper Collins was not in the least concerned uh, about utilizing it. Had we been sued by Eli Lilly, we would have sold more books. And I think they <laughs> they basically know that you can reverse leverage things in this culture. Not so much abroad. The Dutch took Prozac out of the title of the Dutch oh. edition because they were worried about getting sued. But but I mean, they wouldn't get sued because who's going to sue Holland? I mean, you know, in, in terms of if you're going to go for, for, for a lawsuit, you're going to go for the big enchilada, right? The USA is a place to be litigious. But it's very interesting to hear you your uh, experience with this same issue um and it's a, it's certainly a gray area right fair use is very much a gray area yeah it's always changing and evolving too like uh, it, it used to be much stricter uh on quoting music lyrics uh, if you quote, quoted even a line you know the publisher was sending you to get uh permission and that kind of thing and and not not as much anymore no i couldn't i i published a novel posthumously a dear friend and mentor passed away and he we discovered a novel of his okay that he left on a hard drive so his son and i edited it took four years it was a big project but in that novel for example he had he had used the stanza from one of leonard cohen's songs and we tried i mean i know what due process is any author has to know and I went, it turns out that Sony, I think, owns through this whole chain of buyouts, Sony owns the rights, and they wouldn't even answer my email. Yeah. You know, I couldn't even get, because this was such small potatoes, it wasn't going to be worth it for them to license it to us, even if we could have afforded to pay. In the end, we just we just took out the line so as not to rock anyone's tree, shake anyone's tree. But it, it is becoming a very complicated issue, without a doubt. We have a couple of minutes left. Is there a quick question anyone wants to fire off at Bill before we wrap this episode of the Agora? We have any anyone out there who who wants to to chime in? You have a chance. If not, we'll we'll just thank Bill. This has been really interesting, Bill. And uh, thank you, Lou, and thank you everybody for being here and for the questions. Been a lot, been a lot of fun, enjoyable conversation. And uh, you know, if anybody wa wants to get in touch, uh, that I'm always glad to get email from folks and uh, and connect and uh, and all that kind of thing. Well, I hope we make a dent in your book sales. Uh, people will probably be scurrying off to Amazon to check you out. But this has been illuminating, entertaining, enlightening, and a lot of fun. I'm really happy that you 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 came on the show, and thank you so much for that. Uh, next month, just a quick announcement: we have Anders Linzeth the godfather of philosophical counseling in Scandinavia um, and uh, another pioneer of the movement. So Anders will be joining us on April 20th. That's a Saturday. You'll get the email and the link and all of this. But Bill, it's been terrific. This will go through post-production. We get permission from everyone who's had a, a speaking part, you, you, you front and center. And then if everyone's happy with the video, we it goes on our YouTube channel and it lives on. OK, so <laughs> you'll get more exposure. And We're really grateful to you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Lou. It's an honor talking to you and, and great to meet everybody here today. Yeah, it's been fantastic. And we're, we're all, I'm sure, very, very appreciative now, even more so of all this wonderful work you've done. So let's give Bill a round of applause before we sign off. Thank you, everybody, for joining. And uh, we'll see you next time on the Agora. Take a picture, Lou. Take a, a picture. picture. Yeah, Rick, we got the film. We don't, we, we, I okay. always love your reminders, but actually this is all live to tape. So we could freeze, okay. we, we can That's extract true. frames, you know, and Photoshop them too. So no worries. 
Thanks again, yeah. Bill. Be well, everyone. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, you everyone. See you next time, okay? Take care and bye for now. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Thank you.